Someone has referred to this letter as Paul's last will and testament sent to his son in the ministry or his spiritual son, Timothy. He does write it from a Roman prison cell. We've, we talked about some chronology last week with 1 Timothy, and, and we do believe, given the evidence, that this was, a, this was a subsequent Roman imprisonment, not the house arrest that he had experienced before. This was after he comes back from Spain on the fourth missionary journey that we don't have recorded in Acts. And by that time, we'll get into this a little later, by that time Nero was really turning the heat up on the Christians, and we'll see why as we progress here. Timothy's being challenged in his ministry in Ephesus, and so Paul is challenging him to rise to the occasion, uh, to live godly before them, preach the word in and out of season. That is, when, when, you, when you are really tuned into that task and when you don't feel like that task. In season, out of season. The Word does not need my enthusiastic endorsement for it to be effectual. It certainly helps when the person communicating the Word has an enthusiastic commitment to it, right? But Timothy is a frail creature of dust like the rest of us here. He warns him about the coming apostasy, which I said earlier, I believe if it was coming then, it is, it is alive and well today, some 2,000 years later. He challenges Timothy to remember the importance of God's Word. Anchor yourself in the Word. Set the Word before people. Not your opinions, not your experiences. They have their place, but they all should be in submission to the full authority, the preeminence of the Word. And of course, as, as they referenced, for Timothy, that's the Old Testament. Remember, the the evangelism handbook for the Christians in the book of Acts was the Old Testament. That's where they preached Christ from. Well, so let's get a little uh, outline survey going here just real quickly. We believe it was written from a Roman prison around 67 AD. It should have been as I said, when you look at the sequence of things after he's returned from his fourth missionary journey. Two major themes here that I see uh, to persevere in present testings and to endure in future testing. So there, you're, you're involved in it now, Timothy, and there's going to be more to come. Uh, that's the reality. People who come to Christ so that they can, can find uh, relief from the troubles of life will be disappointed quickly. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. We've told you before, the word for trouble there is the word thalipsis. In this world you will be squeezed. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So, so Paul uh, is going to address Timothy on, how, on persevering in the present testings. Look at it's chapter 1 and chapter 2 here. He first of all opens giving thanks for P Timothy's faith. Let's look at that. I don't have it on a slide, I don't think, but let's look at uh, 2 Timothy uh, 1, 1 to 5, and listen how he opens the letter. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, as I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I'm sure, dwells in you as well. Uh, he's, it's a very tender 
opening. He's, Timothy's facing challenges. Depending on the level of knowledge Timothy has about Paul's imprisonment, if he, if he is aware that it, it looks like Paul will not come out, he's certainly going to be aware of that by the time you get through the letter, then it in intensifies things for Timothy. He will be left without his mentor. You can imagine all the stuff that rushes through. Am I ready? Am I, am I, am I able? What am I going to do without Paul? How can, and all the stuff he's, he's, he's battling here. So he reminds him of, the, of Timothy's responsibility in the gospel and the power of the gospel. Uh, he, he challenges him in chapter 2 with some characteristics of what a faithful minister looks like, what faithfulness will look like for Timothy. It's really uh, kind of a manual for him to follow. Uh, one, I think one commentator I read says that this, be, this being a battle, a battle plan manual uh, for Timothy to go forward. And so he's challenging him to, to persevere in the gospel message, the requirements of, of doing that. And then the second major uh, heading here is enduring in, in future testings, chapter 3 and 4, that there's an approaching day of apostasy and that, that Timothy needs to stand firm. He needs to resist the temptation. Brothers and sisters, we are, we are in a day now that very honestly, I never imagined we would be fighting on some of the fronts we're fighting on. And we're fighting on them with people who have been friends, uh, my friends, uh, in the past. People I've commended to you. People I've encouraged you to watch their videos, to read their books. People we've shared in prayer meeting together. We rejoice when the Lord places them in positions of leadership. And uh, it's astounding to see what's happening on various fronts. Now forget for a moment how, how wicked the culture is. I mean, we're seeing things in our culture that, that are appalling. Do you realize, in the light of what is happening in the halls of the U.S. Senate right now, that your sons, your grandsons, are not safe? That 25, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, someone can accuse them of something, and in this current climate, they are de facto guilty with or without evidence. It is a, we, we've, we've tossed out the biblical principles for, for the law of evidence. We've tossed it apparently out of courts. We're in really strange territory, brothers and sisters. And so we're in difficult times. We must stand firm. We must not surrender and give in to the winds of the times. Even when it is suggested by people that we have formerly highly respected. So the day of apostasy. Then he charges him to preach the word, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. We'll be seeing that passage. And then, then he talks about his approaching death. And we'll read that when we get to the end of the study tonight. So, so proclaim the gospel to the end, to the very end. As we expand upon that a little bit, uh, Paul uh, calls Timothy in, in chapter 2, verse 3, a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is where the fellow said it's a combat manual. When, you, when you're into the letter and he, he, ad he addresses Timothy that way. And so this one writer picked out these terms. I thought this was interesting. He uses language of, of warfare for the spiritual warfare that Timothy's facing. Stir up, chapter 1, verse 6. Do not be ashamed, chapter 1, verse 8, 12 and 13. Share with me in the sufferings. In other words, don't think you're going to be exempt from that. Chapter 1, verse 8. Hold fast to sound words. There's this theme of guarding the deposit, guarding this, this, this body of truth that I taught you that, you, that you received from me, but really received from the Lord by the virtue of the way you embraced it. This good thing, keep the good thing. Chapter 1, verse 14. Be strong. Chapter 2, verse 1. Endure hardship. Chapter 2, verse 3. Be diligent to present yourself approved. Chapter 2, verse 15. Flee things. Pursue things. Chapter 2, verse 22. Avoid. Verse 23. Be aware. Chapter 4, verse 15. So there's this language of warfare that Paul is using to exhort Timothy and challenge him and warn him. And at the heart of it, as I said earlier, is the, is the sure foundation 
of the Word of God. Joshua led us this morning in a, in a different rendition of how firm a foundation uh, is, is laid for his saints in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who to Jesus for refuge have fled? This firm foundation is the word of God. And then to uh, persevere through the testing. He talks about his genuine faith. We read that in chapter 1, those opening verses. He tells about Onesiphorus, who went to find Paul in Rome when others abandoned him. To be identified with Paul at this particular season when Nero was, was anxious to find a scapegoat for what, what appeared to be his being responsible for burning half of Rome, uh, it became great sport to identify Christians, and he, he was hanging it on them as, as the reason for this. So he challenges Timothy to be faithful on that. And then, then to, to not only be faithful himself, but to lay down a legacy. And this, you know this passage, 2 Timothy 2, 2. But it's very interesting. There's four generations mentioned here. If you're talking about disciple making, right? And what you have heard from me, there's generation one. In the presence of many witnesses, in trust to faithful men. So Timothy had heard from Paul, and he had received what Paul had given to him in the gospel. So there's generation one, Paul. Generation two, Timothy. Entrust these things to faithful men. There's generation three who will be able to teach others also. There's generation four. There's four generations contemplated in the disciple-making mandate that Paul gives to Timothy, and we should operate off of that ourselves. Wherever you are in the journey, you're, you're the... Uh, you're the f first generation as far as disciple making. Now, I know there's generations before us. I know my, my godly mother uh, laid the foundation for me when I was a child and, and her mother and before her. But as far as my concern, I'm generation one. Who's generation two for me? And then from generation two, am, am I teaching this and sharing this in such a way that those who received that from me are teaching others also? laying it down. So uh, it's, a good, it's a good model for us to keep before us. And he gives these, these uh, examples of work, of that of a, of a teacher, a soldier, a farmer, a workman, a vessel, a servant. Uh, all these images come up in chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. He, he, he warns Timothy not to let himself get, him, get bogged down into false speculation, foolish quarrels, youthful lust. Are you familiar with the Uncle Ramus stories? They're kind of taboo today um, because they're viewed, viewed as racist. But, but uh, did any of you ever see the movie The Song of the South? It's a great movie. You can't find it hardly. It's, it's, it's also considered uh, uh, contraband today. But the Song of the South is one of the very few that Disney never uh, reissued. Uh, but in that, there's a, there's a character named Uncle Ramus. He's a, he's a, he's a black countryman. And uh, he tells this story. Do any of you know? I, am I telling you something you don't know? Okay, you're familiar. All right. Uh, and you have Br'er Fox, Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Bear, these characters. And Br'er just means brother in the, in the, in the slang dialect. And it's all about uh, uh, Br'er Rabbit, who's kind of, kind of wily, uh, getting away with stuff. Br'er Fox, who's, who's real uh, conniving. He wants to always catch uh, Br'er Rabbit in, in some scheme. And then Br'er Bear, who's just kind of slow and just kind of goes along with, with Br'er Fox all the time. Well, they come up with this, this plan to capture Br'er Rabbit. Um, and they set up this, this thing they call Tar Baby. It's, a, it's like a snowman, but made of tar. And that they, they get Br'er Rabbit to encounter him, and Br'er Rabbit takes a swing at him. 
And when he takes a swing at him, he sticks to Tar Baby. And so he thinks, well, I've got to get out of this. So he takes another swing and that other. So now he's got two hands stuck to Tar Baby. And then he thinks, well, I've got to get loose. So he takes a foot and sticks up there to push it loose. Now he's got three appendages and finally gets all four appendages stuck to Tar Baby. That image I share with you because that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Don't get stuck on Tar Baby with these, these speculations. Avoid them. Just make much of Jesus. And that's, that's a good lesson for us. There's a danger, particularly when you're, when you're in, engaged in theological study and theological conversation, theological thought. There's a danger that we will chase after or respond to every aberrant wind that blows across. And we need to keep making Jesus the main thing uh, and not let ourselves get drawn away into that. It's excellent advice. And then he tells him about the... the Future. So he says to him in 2 Timothy 2, 22, Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. At this point in my life, I don't, I may initially engage somebody, but the first minute I pick up that they're not teachable, I don't have time. I don't have time. I'm willing to learn from anybody who can teach me. I'm willing to teach anybody who, who recognizes they need to be learned. But I don't have time to convince somebody who's already convinced otherwise. And it's just a, just a stewardship of time for me. Then this time of growing apostasy. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 9. I don't know if I put this, if I have that on there. Did I, did I get that up there? Um, he says in chapter 3, verse 1, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people, and there are, there's all these terms here. People will be uh, self-lovers, is how it comes across in the Greek. Money lovers, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Rampant parental disobedience is a mark of, of, the, of the times of apostasy. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control. One of the things, one of the marks, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Yet the time will come when the society is without self-control. Brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure. And it's really pleasure lovers rather than God lovers. Having an appearance of godliness. This is the fascinating thing. He's talking about people who, would, who otherwise would want to be counted among those who at least are God-fearers and possible Christ followers, an appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women and burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning. Here's their, so it's not that they're, that they're uh, intellectually ignorant, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. This, this knowledge, we've talked about this before. It's not just, not just knowing something, it's knowing someone, knowing God. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind, disqualified regarding faith. This is, this is a uh, reprobate is the word, cast away concerning the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all as was that of those two men. So he warns Timothy against this, this spirit of, of arrogance and godless, godlessness that only manifests it more so and will, will ultimately, even among friends, will ultimately bring persecution on the true followers of Jesus Christ. And so uh, he tells him to follow his teaching, and that's what chapter 3, verses 10 and following uh, say. And it's in this section that, that he teaches that all Scripture is, is theonoustos. It's God-breathed. I think the Bible project said God-spirited from the word noustos, but it's the, it's the breath of God. Of course, we know that the Spirit is the breath of God um, in, in a symbol. And so all Scripture, and, and what that says is all the, all the holy writings, the sacred writings, that's the, that's the Old Testament. When we hear people today, we've, we've gone through this now, we've been through the 39 books of the Old Testament, and people just questioning the authorship of this, questioning that. Let God be true and every man a liar. 
the Old Testament is inspired by God, as though God spoke every word of it himself to us. And so he charges him, 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Well, he's just described this generation in the previous verses. They won't put up with it. They won't sit under it. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will, they will not uh, spend any energy to gather in a local church to study about Jesus Christ, but they'll drive halfway around the country to hear a good prophecy conference. And they'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And it's the very thing that Paul has warned Timothy not to do. As for you, verse 5, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And so then the, the letter closes, of course, with those very personal words about his, his pending death. We'll look at those a little later. All right, what about the introduction to 2 Timothy? It's interesting. I want, you to, I want you to put yourself where Paul is. This, he is so, has been so conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Remember we, we remark when we look at Jesus on the cross and how he, how he could be, should be consumed with what he is facing, what he is enduring, and yet he, is, he speaks from the cross and it's clear that he has others on his mind. Paul's the same way. He has a real sense that he's facing Roman execution. But he uses the opportunity to teach, to fill in what's missing in Timothy's instruction. To get him strengthened to carry on the work. Paul doesn't spend a lot of time saying, well, I just never knew it was going to end like this. I thought it would be better than this. I can't imagine. None of that. None of that. And so he, uh, he warns Timothy to be sound in the faith because there are those with itching ears they won't listen. Paul tells him, don't, don't get undone when they go to find somebody telling them what they want to hear. The proverb says that the wounds of a friend are faithful and the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. It's a good warning about this sort of thing. What about the, uh, the of course, the name of it is Pros Timotheon B, the, the second, to Timothy the second. Letter. So, uh, authorship, there's really not a lot of speculation about the authorship, that Paul being the author of this. Uh, one writer observed that Timothy's name is found more often in the salutations of Paul's letters than any other name. You can see that in 2 Corinthians and Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Philemon. He's, he mentions him more. Uh, in his in his uh, greetings than he does anyone else in the New Testament. We know from Acts 16 that Timothy's father was a Greek and his mother and grandmother were, were from a Jewish background. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time with this. We've, we studied this uh, several years ago, the difference, the contrast about why Paul had Timothy circumcised when he was traveling and why he refused to have Titus circumcised. Titus was from a from Gentile mother and father. And Paul would use that, as, and we'll look at this a little more when we get to Titus, as an occasion to say, no, Gentiles do not submit to circumcision. They don't become proselyte Jews before they become Christians. Timothy, however, was a little different situation. He came from a Jewish background because he had a Greek father. His, his, his Greek father did not uh, pursue circumcising him when he, was, when he was a baby. And so Paul knew that this would be an offensive It'd be an unnecessary stumbling block if, if Timothy was preaching to, to Jewish Christians or to Jews who were not yet Christians. And so Paul had him circumcised to take that, to remove that, since a good Jew should have had that take place when the boy was a child. It's very fascinating, the, the distinctions about why Paul did the one and not the other. It's a very real reason as to why he would have done that. 
the date and setting for 2 Timothy. Having reconstructed things as we did last week, we just, we add to it with the, with the letter, to, uh, Timothy, the second letter. And uh, Nero had come into power in 54 AD in Rome, and he ruled until 68 AD. It is believed, if you've read any, anything about the Roman Empire, that Nero, in a fit of madness, uh, set uh, Rome on fire, had it set on fire, and half of Rome burned. Well, of course, that was a great backlash to the citizenry of Rome. And so Nero, to find, to get himself off the hook, since it was suspicioned that he had done this, accused the Christians. And what, here's what he did. What are Christians in that day always talking about? What's one of their themes? A fiery ending of the world. That the world's going to end in just a great consuming fire. Well, Nero was familiar with part of that message, and he said that the Christians set Rome on fire to bring the world to an end. And of course, they paid a great, a great price for that. The, the fire was in uh, July of 64 AD. Now, Paul, not long after that, is headed to, he's headed to Spain. So when he comes back, as, as at Troas, uh, in all likelihood, one of his people who had been a, a friend at some level, associate with him, uh, had him arrested as a Christian. And so he's taken immediately, not allowed, doesn't have time to pack, to get his cloak, to get his parchments, his scrolls, and he's taken off to Rome to be placed in jail to await trial and pretty certain execution if he's, a, if he's considered as a leader of the Christians. And he'd been in Rome before under house arrest. He returned probably to this, to Troas around 66 AD. And so they uh, had him arrested. When you piece the chronology together, it seems that Paul wrote this letter in the fall of 67 AD. The reason we can say fall of 67 AD is because he says to Timothy, bring my cloak. Winter's coming. Winter's coming. And so he wrote this then, and he wanted to see Timothy again. He wanted to have one last visit with him. Uh, Timothy still in Ephesus. On his way to Rome, he would have traveled through Troas. That's the natural route to go. It would, have been, would not have been out of the way or uncharacteristic for him to pick up Paul's cloak. And and the, the writings, the scriptures that he wanted. Some think that Tychicus, we've talked about him before, would have been the bearer uh, of this letter. If you want to look over at chapter 4, uh, verse 12, when he says, and we'll pick up in uh, verse 9, do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with his present world, has deserted me, gone to Thessalonica, Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. That's a change. Paul and Barnabas had a separation over John Mark's when he lost heart in the previous missionary journey, the first missionary journey, and, and they parted ways. Paul and Silas teamed up, Barnabas and John Mark teamed up, and now you see, this is beautiful to me because near the end of Paul's life, the gospel of reconciliation is at work here. Bring Mark with you. He's useful to me. You can imagine that Paul had said, I don't have any use for him after that first episode. Tychicus, I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left, and so on and so forth. So um, that's kind of a flow of the chronology to give you an idea that, that, that Paul is the author that's, that's very little disputed. And then as far as the theme and purpose, well, we, we said at the outset that it's a, you know, enduring uh, in ministry. Paul wants to be able to finish, but he wants Timothy to finish. He didn't want Timothy to lose heart. I got a, a book several months ago uh, from uh, Dr. Jimmy Draper, who was headed Lifeway after he pastored. Uh, he pastored First Baptist Church in Dallas. He pastored a church in, uh, 
outside of Dallas. I'm, I'm blank right now. First Baptist will come to me. Uh, but anyway, he was one of my mentors. I got to spend some time with him while I was in seminary, and they assigned me to him. Just a, just a great guy. But he wrote a book, uh, don't, don't Quit Before You Finish. And it's a challenge to ministers not to, not to lose heart, not to give up, uh, and not to grow weary in, in well-doing so that you faint rather than persevere to the end and reap. And this is Paul, really what the theme of what Paul is, is telling Timothy, endure, endure. It's, it's tough in Ephesus, I know. Endure. Paul's facing the brunt of it in Rome. He, he knows in a way that Timothy doesn't know yet what's coming for Christians. And so he challenges him to be faithful to the end. Trusting in God. God will help him to overcome obstacles that hinder the spread of the gospel. We know that Timothy was, had, a, had a sickness about him, take a little wine for the stomach's sake. We know that he was timid. Let, uh, he, he was kind of insecure about his youth. Let no one despise your youth. You hear these, these exhortations that come to him. And so Paul is really trying to build him up when he could be focused on his own uh, approaching uh, demise. So you have to admire that. I think that's a wonderful, a wonderful trait. And then we look at the keys, the keys to 2 Timothy. Well, of course, the, the theme, uh, endurance in ministry. The verses, we read them earlier. I won't, I won't uh, uh, take the time to read them again, but they're... They're thematic. They tell us, help us understand Timothy. The key chapter, though, is the second chapter. Uh, one writer said this, that the uh, second chapter of Second Timothy ought to be required daily reading for every pastor, full-time Christian worker, and volunteer Christian worker. He lays out keys to an enduring, successful ministry. Here's four from this, from this chapter. A reproducing ministry in the, in the early verses of chapter 2. An enduring ministry to continue. A studying ministry to be sure that you're, you're, you're seriously taking the Word of God seriously. You might be surprised, I don't know, how many people uh, wing it. I mean, they just wing it. It's, uh, it's, it's scary, really, sometimes. And they don't take the study of the Word seriously. And then a holy ministry, a godly life, reflected from having truly encountered, not just, not just done an uh, intellectual study of the Scripture, but having encountered the Lord in the Scripture so that the Spirit of God is transforming you as a result of your study. We're going to be looking at that, by the way, on Wednesday nights, this <clears throat> Psalm 119, all that the Word does, <clears throat> these, these 11 different terms used to describe the Scriptures and the, and the, the transformational impact that has on life. Well then, what about, what do we say about Jesus here? Um, well, the first thing Paul teaches is that, that when Jesus appeared on earth in the incarnation, that he abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Look at 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses uh, 8 to 10, and we'll, we'll key in on 10. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You know, if you, if you really believe Jesus has abolished death, then what enemy do you and I have? He's tamed death. Death becomes for the Christian a, a wonderful means of transporting us from this world to the world which is to come, what, what John Bunyan called the celestial city in his book, Pilgrim's Progress. John Owen probably the genius of the Puritans, arguably uh, the, most, the most brilliant of all the Puritan writers, wrote a book entitled The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. When Christ died, he killed death. 
Doesn't mean that none of us will ever die again, but, he, but it's transformative. Now that we're followers of Jesus Christ, death holds no terror for us. We have a Savior who conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave, and, and he, has, he has neutered them. He's neutered them on our behalf. And so, so Paul paints Jesus in this, in this way. Uh, he also rose from the grave. Paul talks about this in 2 Timothy 2, 8. I'm going to read 2, 8 through 10 because he talks about him providing salvation and eternal glory. Listen, 2 Timothy 2, 8 to 10. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, so that's the Davidic covenant, as preached in my gospel, for which I'm suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Now, that's very comforting for Timothy to hear. Timothy's facing his challenges in Ephesus from within and from without. Paul says, I'm in chains, a criminal. And as was said in the video, because he was identified as a criminal several times by Jewish authorities, Roman authorities, some of those who were part of his entourage, part of his team, abandoned him. They did not want to be associated with a criminal. He says, the word of God is not bound. I may be in chains, but, but God's mission has not been impeded. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The, here he's talking about salvation in all of its tenses ushered into glorification, eternal glory. Then he write, tells Timothy in the next verse about the promise of if, if we die with him, how we live with him. Look at 2 Timothy 2.11. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. Well, when did we die with him? When we were born again. When we were born again. Paul says in Romans, you died. You died to sin. You can't, you can't live it any longer as, a, as something dominating your life. If you died to that. And then he promises Timothy in chapter 4. Well, let's look at chapter 2, verse 12. This, this crown of righteousness, the prospect of reigning with him. If we endure... We will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also he also will deny us. And so he says in chapter four, verse eight, henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. In other words, those who long for the parousia, the, the appearing of Jesus, the coming of Jesus. And Paul has just said previously in those verses that he's fought the good fight. He's finished the course. He's kept the faith. And so it's, it's, it's his confidence at that point that though he has not been executed yet, that he, when he is, it will, not, it will not dissuade him. You know, he's going to be called upon to recant. That's what, the, that's what Romans did. They would gather these Christians in the arenas and say, now you confess that Caesar is Lord and we'll let you live. And they would say, no, Jesus is Lord. And then they would suffer unspeakable torment and torture. Well, what about the contribution of 2 Timothy to the, to the Bible itself? As we said at the beginning, this is his, Paul's last will and testament. Uh, he does a review of the, the past. He gives Timothy an analysis of the present. And then he anticipates the future in terms of delivery, but not being delivered from the Roman prison, but being delivered by God through death into the heavenly kingdom. It provided comfort for Timothy, encouragement, motivation to him, and it has done so for distressed Christians throughout the centuries. The scriptures are central in this, and they should be in any Christian's life and in any New Testament church has one of the clearest statements of inspiration in it of any place in Scripture. I'll read them to you again. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And here's the purpose, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So this, this breathed out 
Scripture, the Old Testament. By the way, uh, Peter in the New Testament talks about Paul's writings as inspired. And so when, when Peter's writing under inspiration, he just adds the whole body of Paul's material to the Old Testament uh, as inspired material. But they're very profitable. They're valuable for these things. And then 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Have confidence in the word. It's interesting that this uh, letter is full of personal references to Paul, to Timothy, and to over 20 other people. It's only four chapters long. 20 other people. And some of these are not mentioned anywhere else in the Scripture. It has these warnings about the coming apostasy. We read uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 9, and chapter 4, verses 3 to 4 earlier. We'll not take time to do that, but I do want to close tonight by reading these last instructions and final greetings of Paul in chapter 4, verses 9 and follow. We read verse 9 earlier down through 10. Let's pick up with verse 13. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. Also the books and above all the parchments. Above all the parchments, these would be Old Testament scrolls. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. May have been the one who turned him in in Troas. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. So here he is brought before the Roman tribunal, and no one's there with him. May it not be charged against him. There's a, that's, that sounds hauntingly what Jesus says from the cross, what Stephen says when he's being stoned to death. It's amazing the dying grace that God gives. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Notice where he's, where he's going to be transported safely. Not, not I'm going to get out of this. No. This time the rescue will be through death. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth. I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace to you. And so, this picture of Paul, as he says in the earlier verses, in verse 6, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The, the time of my departure has come. If you knew you were going to die, what's the last thing you would want to communicate with somebody? It's very instructive for us, isn't it? Very instructive. May the Lord help us to, to receive the spirit that Paul was communicating to Timothy. To be, you know, somebody, somebody was used by God to bring us to faith in Christ. None of us came to faith in Christ in a vacuum. We've been receivers of this. How will we live to honor and bless that legacy? Okay, that's our, ourselves as receivers. Then ourselves as givers, as disciple makers. Who will we speak into as the next generation? And who will we pray for that we've spoken into that they will, they will also speak into someone's life, a third generation, and then a fourth, and then a fifth? That's what you think about when you know it's about to come to an end. 
May God help us to be ready when that time comes. So we fought the good fight. We finished the course. We kept the faith. You know people as well as I do that you may have walked with years ago would be what Bunyan calls in his Pilgrim's Progress a fair, flourishing believer. And yet today they're not. Today they're not. They can't say they fought the good fight. Anyone who says that of them is a hypocrite. Couldn't say they finished the course and would have no way to know if they kept the faith. May God help us to finish well. That's my desire for myself and for you. Any questions or comments?